Well, good morning. We're going to begin in uh, Ruth this morning. So we're going to continue on. Thank you for being a part of uh, our Old Testament overview, going through the books of history. And like I said last week, you know, Ruth is one of those books where it uh, it certainly is a history. It's a narrative. It's a story of God working within a specific family in a really powerful way within the, the storyline. Uh, but if you go into other traditions, you look at uh, the, the Hebrew ordering of the Old Testament, Ruth sometimes, often is, placed within what we would call, or what they call the writings. So Psalms, Proverbs, a whole host of other books. And interestingly enough, you see that, that connection there. Uh, it, in that Hebrew ordering of the, of the Old Testament, Ruth follows immediately after the book of Proverbs. And uh, we know Proverbs 31, the description of a, a noble woman uh, there in Proverbs 31. That language that's used of the, the noble woman in Proverbs 31 is the same phrase. It's only used one other time in the Old Testament. Same phrasing that is used to describe Ruth by Boaz, as we're going to see in, uh, in chapter 2 of Ruth, I believe. And so that's it's a beautiful connection even there, where even in the ordering of the Old Testament in that way, uh, in the in the writings that we are somewhat told, I think that Ruth is an example of this kind of noble woman, you know, Proverbs thirty one woman woman in some sense, which is a beautiful connection. But uh, English ordering, uh, we have Ruth here in uh, what we can call the uh, the uh, what we're calling the histories. So we're going to continue on, and we see that connection. That connection is very much. Uh, Consistent with the text itself, you can go ahead and flip to Ruth 1, and, uh, and we're going to pray as well, but I just want to begin here. Ruth chapter 1, uh, verse 1, and it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So picking up right where we left off last week in the book of Judges and getting to see God's providential work in this family and what it means for people, the people of Israel going forward and, and even us today. But let me pray for us, and then I want us to revisit that phrase and talk about where we were last week and how that helps us to understand the book of Ruth. So let me, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, we are uh, insufficient for this task to, to come to your, your word, your, your spoken, revealed word to us. Uh, but Lord, thank you that you equip us and that you promise to help us and make your word uh, clear to us by your spirit that we might be obedient and become more like Jesus. And so I pray that that is what you would do for us this morning, that you would conform us and shape us uh, as we behold your glory, even here in the book of Ruth. So thank you for our time and be with us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want us to pick up from where we were last week and just briefly think through. Uh, you know, as we said, Ruth 1.1 1, 1 says, In the days when the judges ruled. So when you read that line and just imagine that you hadn't been in a class last week where we talked about judges, what should that bring to mind when we're beginning to read the book of Ruth where we read that first phrase, In the days when the judges ruled. What should that bring to our mind as we begin to read this this text. Any thoughts? Okay, sure. Just the no, that's that's good. I mean, just the immediately preceding verse. If we flip back over a page, Judges twenty one twenty five. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Okay, what else? What feelings should that provoke in us? Or just imagine that you're a, a ninth or 10th century Jew, Israelite, and you read that phrase. What, what emotions and feelings would that prompt in you? Okay, that's good. Absolutely. Longing? Maybe even more specifically, what do you think the, the sense of longing uh, that it would produce? What are they longing for in this place in the storyline a king sure that's back to judges 21 25 there, there was no king in israel and so there is this longing uh longing for 
a king, both forward-looking in the, in the case of the narrative, but as the people of God retroactively looking back, uh, they're able to read it in that context as well. It's like, this is what it looked like to be longing for the arrival of the king. Okay, anything else? In the days when the judges ruled, what sort of expectations, feelings are associated with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. I think that's helpful, right? I mean, just, again, just reading this as a narrative, reading it as literature, in terms of the plot from Judges, we were in this step down, and in those last few chapters, we are in the downward spiral. And so we pick up in Ruth, and what's the question? Are we going to keep going on this trajectory? Is there any any respite, any relief here? Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And, and we're going to see, even in, we, we jump over that, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. It's like, okay, there's another famine. There's famines in the Bible. Let's move on. Yeah. Sure. Where's the hope? Yeah. And and we even in how it's introduced, our response should be, oh, man, this is getting worse. Because not only are the judges ruling, but there is a famine. And we're going to see here shortly that what that should bring to mind for us and the first readers is the people are experiencing God's covenant curses. I mean, this is what God said would happen if they departed from from the covenant. And interestingly enough, you go there was uh, there was a study done several years ago, and it was br trying to bring out the uh, the help that our own cultural context, our own social location, you could say, brings to noticing different things within the text. Not necessarily changing interpretive meaning, but how our own situation influences how we read the Bible. And there was a survey done of people in the Western world and in uh, other Middle Eastern contexts uh, or uh, African in African nations and peoples. They would give them this passage or another passage very like it and say, what did you notice about this text? And all of the people from the Western world would say something about uh, I don't know, about the judges ruling or this is what had happened in the land. Everyone else in different contexts in the world notice there's a famine. Right? That is the most significant thing. That's just not a problem that we, we deal with uh, in our own context where most of the world still does. So that's a very significant point that's being, being drawn out. But yeah, that's all good. That's the situation that we have. There's a sense of longing, sense of expectation, hopelessness. Uh, and asking the question, God, where are you, right? I mean, you, we, we, we see that you are bringing about the covenant curses here in some sense, but do you steer, still care about your people? I think that's a question that everyone is asking in the flow coming into Ruth chapter 1. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And that's helpful, right? Because there's certainly, there's physical aspects to a famine, but picking up where we left off in Judges, we can certainly say not only was there a physical famine, but there was a spiritual famine in the land. I mean, it's just a desolate wasteland in the people's hearts. And and that dictates how they're responding to, to God and what they're seeing. So this is good. So yeah, that's what we're seeing here coming into the book of Ruth. And I think it's important for us picking up from Judges 21-25 and just to notice where we're going in the the storyline of the Old Testament is that the book of Ruth really begins for us 
a portion of the Old Testament in which it is focused on this notion of kingship, right? The, in the book of Judges, we repeat over and over again towards the end of the book, there was no king in Israel. And here in the book of Ruth, the question is answered a little bit more of saying, well, who is this king going to be? And we, we, we see in the book of Ruth that this is beginning to point to King David and ultimately beyond King David to the Lord Jesus. But Ruth is, in some sense, kind of a, an origin story, even for King David, uh, answering questions like who he is, where did he come from, promises that God made to him as king and his significance in in redemption history. So, you know, often we come to the book of Ruth and we would say, well, who is the book of Ruth about? It's like, well, we call it the book of Ruth. She's obviously a very honorable and godly figure. Uh, but in many, in many senses, we read the book of Ruth and I think we're meant to see that it is about Ruth, but it's even more in many ways about Boaz, who Boaz is, and how his character reflects upon the character of God. And also the same of who is this David that we're told about in the very, uh, the very last verse, last couple verses of the book of Ruth. So in many senses, it's it's about Ruth, but it's about others, about Boaz and about King David himself. So we see here God's a testimony of God's faithfulness to His people, faithfulness to a specific family among His people, and faithfulness to a foreigner to Ruth, a, who we're going to see is a Moabite woman who is incorporated into God's people and incorporated into the family line of, of King David uh, himself. So let's, I'll just go ahead and read that for you. Ruth chapter 4 verse 17 says, A son has been born to Naomi, and this is speaking of Ruth and Boaz's son. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then again, the last couple verses are specifically uh, the generations leading up to the birth of, of David. And that's where the, the book closes. Obed, Father Jesse, and Jesse, Father David. So that's where we're going. Let's think through some, some contextual issues here uh, for us to be aware of just surrounding this book. In terms of authorship, authorship is unknown. Uh, different traditions, but ultimately within the text in the book, there's no evidence given as to who would have uh, at least put the pen to paper, per se, to capture this story uh, of, of Ruth. Uh, in terms of timing of writing, when was it written? I think it's fair to say that Ruth was likely written during the time of King David. Again, this man has come to the throne and uh, as we always do with political leaders, we ask, well, where did this guy come from? Who is he? Uh, what's his family? And so I think it's, it's fair to say it was likely written during the time of King David, uh, so probably around the, the 11th century uh, B.C. We already saw that it's written uh, as capturing a story within the time of the judges. It's a time of chaos, a time of confusion. And so what we have here is Ruth is a time where we have the big picture of what's happening in the book of Judges, even with some specific stories, but we just know that big picture, it's a time of chaos. And so Ruth is really a time of, uh, as if it's a film, we're, we're, we're zooming in on one specific family, one specific situation where God is working sovereignly in the details to bring about uh, this king that is coming, David, and ultimately we know the true king, the Lord Jesus, and who fulfills all of these promises. So Ruth is a, you could say it's a, it's a breath of fresh air in the, in the narrative that we have so far. Let's look at some, ma I, didn't, I didn't change that one, did I? Major themes of Ruth. We are not in Joshua, so sorry. Uh, major themes of Ruth, what do we see? Well, one I think we could say is that God's unfailing love. Again, just think about the context, the narrative, what is God up to, even in the midst of this horrendous time of the book of Judges. Uh, we're, we're asking, does God still care about his people? Is he still at work? Is he still faithful to his promises? Or has he abandoned his people? Has he left them completely to their devices and to the chaos of their own, their own sin? Well, the answer is, from Ruth, yes, God is still at work. He's still moving. He's still faithful to his promises. And we see how he is bringing that about through, through this family, through Naomi, through Ruth, and through, through Boaz and their, uh, their, their son and their family. Another would be this theme of redemption. 
specifically what we see in Ruth, this notion of uh, kinsman redemption, uh, the kinsman redeemer, who Boaz is, this figure, which has biblical roots. I mean, there's, there's aspects of the Mosaic and Levitical law that are being enacted here in this uh, kinsman redemption, this language that Boaz, is, Boaz uses. What is called elsewhere this notion of leveret marriage uh, is how we describe what takes place between uh, Boaz and Ruth in in this text. And it really undergirds all of the plot, the relationship that Boaz and Ruth uh, eventually have in their marriage being undergirded by these uh, these different aspects from the law and from the culture of uh, what it means to continue a family line uh, in, in the case where husbands have died. Let's look at just a few of those passages just briefly. I want you to see where this comes from within the context of the Mosaic law. So you could go to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. I want us just to see what's what's undergirding the plot here, what's taking place. So Deuteronomy 25. Uh, could somebody read verses... Five through five through ten for us. Deuteronomy twenty five five through ten. That's great. I love that. <laughs> I love that. So this is what we're seeing played out within Ruth. Now, again, it's not a case of brothers, but that really does uh, amplify the seriousness of what's taking place. We're going to see that Naomi's husband dies. And not only does her husband die, but both of her sons die. And so her and Ruth are in a, a drastic situation. And we see Boaz, who could have shirked responsibility to them, taking it upon himself. And we, and we see that what that portrays about God and uh, his character to us. So also another passage for you, you could make note of Leviticus 25, 25 through 31, and 47 through 55. You see that there? Uh, that is a place that you can look as well to see the, the context for this notion of re redemption, kinsman redemption, and, and leveret, leveret marriage. So if we had to give a summary sentence for the book of Ruth, I think here's one way we could put it. That God sovereignly orchestrates all things, the author is very careful, I think, and intentional to point this out using different rhetorical devices to, to point, to, to show, and to highlight God is at work here all throughout the, the telling of this story in this family. Orchestrates all things, even trials, for the good of his people, who he will one day redeem through the perfect rule of the kinsman king. So this is all the aspects that we see here, that God is at work, he's working for his own glory, for the good of his people, and he's working in such a way here in Ruth that's pointing forward to what's coming in a more ultimate sense in the king that, that is coming. So let's go through, I, I want to take some time, and obviously just, you know, the 30, 45 minutes that we have, we can't read through all of Ruth and, and look at all different aspects of it, but I do want us just to take some time to kind of walk through the storyline as we're able and and point out some different things that we, we see here. <coughs> but before we do that, any other questions, thoughts before we dive in? No? Okay, let's do it. So Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. What's going on here in Ruth 1 where we see Naomi who has left uh, the land, left her family's place, and now comes back to the land in chapter 1 and what's going on surrounding that. So Ruth 1, verse 1, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons here. This is what, what's happening. He and his wife and his two sons. So what are some things even in this first verse that should prick our ears? If you're reading this, uh, there's a lot here in this first verse that should um, put our antennas on uh, to, to take note of what's happening in the text. Any, anything that you notice? Okay, absolutely. Bethlehem and Judah. And why, why is that? Why does it stand up? Okay, oh, yeah. associated with Jesus, even from where we've been leading up to in the in the text so far. What are some 
connotations and associations that we see both looking back and also looking forward more immediately in the storyline of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's some aspects of the, the storyline in Judges. Okay. What else? Well, just, yeah, Bethlehem and Judah. That phrase is intentionally, it's repeated in there. It's repeated in the book of Ruth we're going to see. Well, just, you think back through your overview of in the Pentateuch, right? We see this progression where Judah, as a tribe, as an individual and as a tribe, where it's progressively, he's being focused in on more and more. You think of the end of the book of Genesis, right? Genesis uh, 49, where the... Uh, Jacob is speaking to all of his sons and pronouncing blessings and, in some cases, curses on his sons. What does he say about Judah? Genesis 49, the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So we're beginning to see, even in, at the end of the book of Genesis, okay, Judah, there's something special going to happen in Judah. And then, if you're reading this in the time of King David, you think, oh, Bethlehem and Judah, that's where King David comes from. And so th that only heightens uh, the story here. But we're told that they leave Bethlehem and Judah and they go to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So if you can see the map here, you see where they are. So from Bethlehem going to the land of Moab, what should that produce in us? How would that strike even the original readers and us in line with the storyline of the Bible so far? Okay, they're going the wrong direction, right? And seriously, I mean, they, Joshua, you think in the book of Joshua, they, there's the conquest of the land. Judges, there's the results of their failed conquest in the land. And now in Ruth, it's like they're going in reverse. They're leaving the land of promise to go to a foreign pagan nation. Yeah, and they're enemies, right? There's constant conflict between Israel and Judah and the, and, and the Moabites already in the text. For sure. Yeah, so they're making a very, this is not an easy trip. They're making a very difficult and intentional decision, even though there's a famine in the land, to leave the land of promise and to go elsewhere. And I think this, this should draw to mind just elsewhere so far in, in the Pentateuch and in the histories. It, things just don't go well when you leave where God is telling you to go and go elsewhere, right? Just think of the storyline with Abraham. Uh, he, he goes down to Egypt and we don't really know why, and it goes very poorly, right? And you just think in, in other places throughout. So there's not a, <coughs> the author doesn't explicitly give for us, hey, uh, Naomi and Elimelech were acting without faith, or they were sinning in doing this, but there's markers in the text that should make us think, okay, this probably is not going to go well. This is not consistent with God's promises and God's direction, at least it seems uh, so far. So we should ask, is there a lack of trust in them? Are they not trusting God even though there's a famine in the land? Uh, or are they, are they acting shrewdly? Are they taking initiative uh, by some sense trying to exercise some wisdom to provide for their family? And that sort of questions really underlines everything that we see in Ruth. There's always this question in the book of Ruth of, okay, are they acting shrewdly and with wisdom, or are they acting out of a lack of trust in God? We see that with Naomi and other things uh, in, the, in the text going forward. But so they go to the land. They're in Moab. Uh, verses 3 through 5, we see that tragedy strikes. They're in a foreign land. We don't know for how long. I don't, don't believe it says... They were in the land, and Naomi's husband dies. And not only does her husband die, but then also her two sons, uh, who were told in verse 4, had taken Moabite wives. 
So now we have here in Moab, Naomi, who's a foreigner in this land, and her two Moabite daughter-in-laws that are left to themselves. What do you think we're meant to see, or if anything, in this, this clear marker that Naomi and Elimelech's sons marry Moabite wives? Is that meant to prompt anything in us or not within the context so far? Didn't use, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So there's there's multiple things here, right? And you know, and so far in the text, if you're just kind of noticing what's happening throughout the Pentateuch, uh, God all se- often seems to associate, almost always, marriage and worship, right? There's this warning. Now, it doesn't specifically say Moabites, but God does explicitly forbid the people from intermarrying with those in the land of Canaan, right? So the land of promise where they're coming to conquer and drive out. Moab is not included in that, and yet the the nations that are there, God does give this prescription. So Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, he says, don't intermarry And why does God say that? Do not take wives from these peoples that are in the land, because if you do, what will happen? What does God say? Yeah, you're going to follow after their gods. And so there's this connection of of marriage and and worship. And so there's not an explicit prescription, So that, but that should be in the back of our minds. But also, too, like Jill said, we know that all the way back to Genesis 12, right, that the nations are going to be drawn in, that, the, that God called Israel so that they could be a light to the nations. And so there's both of those things should be in the back of our mind. We're asking what's going on here, what's God going to do through this. So then next section, verses 6 through 11, uh, verse 6, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and had given them food. So Naomi decides to return back to the land of Judah. And in this section, she tells her daughter-in-laws to, to leave her, right? To, to return to their families and to find new husbands so that they can be cared for. Uh, because that, that is the way that for there to be social stability, uh, economic certainty in this time is to be, uh, is to be married for these women to be provided for. Let's look at how Naomi gives this instruction to them. Uh, So chapter 1, verse 8. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. The daughter, we know the daughter-in-laws, so Ruth and Orpah, they push back a little bit. And then Naomi reiterates this instruction to them uh, down in verse 11 and 12. She says, turn back, my daughters. Will you go with me? I, don't, I can't have sons. Go back. Uh, now verse uh, 13 and 14, she said, would you wait until I could have sons that you could marry? No, go back. She says, It is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Verse 14, Orpah leaves, but Ruth clings to her. And then what does Naomi say? uh, Reiterates her command to to Ruth. Verse 15, she says, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. So I I want us to think here, what do you think is going on in Naomi's heart and her thought process and her commands and her instructions to her daughter daughters-in-law what, what what's being revealed about Naomi's heart situation through these through this section any thoughts anything that sticks out to you from her instructions to them okay yeah that's yeah that was uh what verse was that? 
It's, well, it's, she said, it's ex- yeah, exceedingly bitter to me. Uh, well, I can't find it, but yes. She's grieving their situation because, again, they are in a very dangerous social situation in light of their husband's dying. She's obviously grieving. Uh, verse, yeah, verse 13. It is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Okay, what else? What does Naomi maybe reveal for us kind of theologically through her statements? What is, what is she saying about who God is, her role, and, and what's in the midst of her tragedy that she's experienced? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so she she recognizes that God is sovereign over what she's experiencing, and yet she re- repeats, reiterates over and over again, "I'm going back to the land. Don't come with me. Go back to your family. Find new husbands." And I, I mean, she even explicitly says there in uh, verse 15, speaking to Ruth, "See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods." Return to your sister-in-law. I think that reveals for us that Naomi is, in what people have described, she's in a very compromised situation spiritually, right? She she blesses them by the name of the Lord, and she says, go. And there's genuine affection there. She's like, go, find rest, find security. And yet she's saying, go find those things apart from the worship of the God of Israel, apart from the land. And, you know, you think previously in what the people of Israel were supposed to be. They're supposed to be a blessing to the nations, a light to the nations, whereby their lives and their experiences would draw the nations in. And what's Naomi saying? No, don't come. Go. Go back to your God. So she, I mean, she obviously has a very compromised view of who God is, the necessity of, of worship, and the true blessing that does come from relationship with him and being under his rule uh, within the land. Okay, yeah, could be there. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Covenant God, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is painting a picture of Naomi that I think is super relevant for us is to see that she she's still living with the ghosts of her spiritual heritage, and yet she's failing to allow that to produce an all encompassing worldview in her in her life and experience, right? You, you see that in a sense? She's speaking, Hey, may God bless you and go, find rest, and yet also she should know the true and only the only flourishing and rest that can be experienced by these women is for them to be under the wings of God's refuge in the land of Israel. That, that is the situation that they're in in, in this place in, in redemptive history. And so she's failing to see that. 
Yeah, yeah. So in, in many ways, uh, you, you think about elsewhere in Scripture, Ruth has a lot of similar features as another book that's in the writings, the book of Job, right? Uh, how do we interpret and live in light of intense suffering? So that's all here in, in chapter 1. But we know, we see that Ruth commits herself. Uh, Ruth demonstrates what I think is appropriate to call remarkable covenant faithfulness, right? She commits herself to Naomi when she would not have had to, and yet she demonstrates that. So look uh, in verse 16. Uh, I want us to hear Ruth's statement to Naomi. She says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So even here, Ruth, this Moabite, this foreign pagan woman, is demonstrating a remarkable, I think, faithfulness to Naomi and an openness and a receptivity to the worship of, of Yahweh, of the God of the people of Israel. And so she commits to go back with her. We see in that last section in chapter 1, they come back. The people are like, oh, there's Naomi. Right? She's been gone for a long time. But she says, I left uh, full. Verse 21, Naomi says, don't, don't call me blessed. Naomi, her, her, na- her name means pleasant, blessed. Don't call me that. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She says, I went out from this land full, uh, and I'm coming back empty, and God has been, uh, God has dealt harshly with me, is, is what she's explaining to the people. But they come back in the land, end of chapter 1, we're told that they come to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Even there, I think the author's saying, hey, look, something's about to happen here, right? Because there was a famine in the land, and now the famine has ceased, and they're back at the time, the time of harvest. So chapter 1, they go out of the land, and they come back. Chapter 2, we begin to see interaction with this new character, the character of Boaz, who really takes up the focus of the rest of the book, just in terms of the amount of speech that's recorded and being the highlighted character, Boaz is the predominant figure uh, from here out, here on out, beginning in chapter 2. So we're told, chapter 2, verse 1, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So we're told that <clears throat> we have this, they have this family figure, who is in a position to do them good. And so the question is, how is he, how is he going to do that? Look at verse 2. So we're told that Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain. After him in whose sight I shall find favor. I think this is remarkably interesting here, that Ruth, a Moabite, a foreigner, a at least now former pagan, she is the one who is taking the initiative to live under the provisions that God had provided for his people in the law. Okay, I want you to, want you to see that. So Deuteronomy uh, chapter 24, for instance. This is one of the places in the Mosaic law that God gives for the care of the vulnerable among the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 24 Uh, beginning in verse 19. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, for the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So Ruth is going to go at the time of the harvest, and she's going to pick up everything that's dropped, the grain that's dropped, the sheaves that are forgotten, all of those things that, that take place naturally every harvest. And under the Mosaic law, God had said, don't go back and get the, that grain that you drop, that you forget. That's going to be the provision for the vulnerable in the land who cannot care for themselves. And so Ruth is the one who, in accordance with that prescription, whether knowingly or unknowingly, is beginning to operate under. Right? She's operating under the provisions of the, the Mosaic law. And we're told that as she goes out to seek a field to find for her to work in, verse 3, she set out and she went and she gleaned in the field after the reapers. And, how does the author put it? in our translation, and she happened 
to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Just happened, right? As luck would have it, by chance, she comes to the field of Boaz. I think this is one of those markers here in the text where the author is showing for us, look at what God is up to, right? God is sovereignly up to something incredible here in their story, and that's he's, he's tuning us uh, to that. So he, God sovereignly works. He brings them, he brings her to the field of Boaz, and she reaps and she works. We have a description of her labor here that one of the, the servants of Boaz sees her working and describes her, her work as being diligent. He says in verse 7 that she, she has gathered among the sheaves and after the reapers, and she has continued in her work from early morning until now except for a short rest. So Ruth's character is being highlighted here. She's, she's diligent. She's working faithfully to provide for her and for her <clears throat> her mother mother-in-law Naomi and then as Boaz comes into the scene uh, even more in focus beginning in verse 8 we see this interaction where Boaz encourages and provides for Naomi in a radical way I mean he goes even above and beyond the prescriptions and the law he, he tells her to come and to eat among his workers. He provides for her safety, that they are not to mistreat her. And even later we see that he instructs his workers to throw out extra grain so that she can pick it up and provide, provide for them. And Ruth questions his kindness. She's like, why are you showing favor to me, a foreigner? Look down at verse 11. This is what Boaz says. He says, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you've left your father and your mother and your native land and come to a people that you did not know before. That's familiar language in the storyline of the Bible. Verse 12, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. It's a beautiful description of someone from the nations coming to take refuge under the God of Israel. And we're going to see that language repeated uh, a little bit later later in the book. So Ruth makes use of, of Boaz's kindness, and she provides for her and Naomi. And Naomi, once she hears about this, she begins to get excited. Look down at verse 20. Ruth has come back, told Naomi what she's been doing, where she's been working. And Naomi says... Boaz, the man is a close relative of ours. He is one of our redeemers. And so in the storyline of Ruth here, we begin to ask, okay, how could Ruth step in and change the situation for Ruth and Naomi here, here in the land? And then in chapter 3, Chapter 3 really is, is the climax of the story. This is where all of the tension, all of the longing, the expectation so far comes to a head. And we have to, have to see, what is Boaz going to do? He's in a position to redeem. He's in a position to help. How is he going to, or not, care for, for Ruth and Naomi? Before we do anything in chapter 3, any, any questions, things we need to look back at from chapter 1, chapter 2? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard it before, but I, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the most fascinating periods of history. Oh, well, that's, yeah. No, that's good. And that, this passage, I mean, if you ask somebody, what do we know about the book of Ruth? They're going to go to that passage. And again, it how and often I think what we do with that is say, oh, look at Ruth. Be like Ruth. Look at her faithfulness. But man, if you take that what she says and compare it to statements elsewhere previously in the Bible, this sounds like language that God uses to describe his people, right? And, and it is. It's describing God's own commitment, covenant faithfulness to his people for his own glory. So, yeah, that's good. No, thank you, Randy. I think one thing that just kind of really, it's, it, it stood out to me in, in chapter 2, very much in the middle of the verses. It says, Boaz is doing well mm. about his sister. Oh, sure. He got, he got him a good one. Mm-hmm. And he's not blind. Yeah. So he, he knows what's going on. For sure. Yeah, this news of them had, had come before them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And so he, we see that in the passage. We know Boaz knows what's going on. Uh, we know Naomi's starting to scheme. Ruth is kind of this, she's kind of caught in the middle. You know, you don't really know where Ruth is at. She's catching up, that's right. So let's briefly talk through chapter 3. I want us to be able to look at some other passages just to pull out a few things. So just big picture, chapter 3 is the climax. Chapter 3 is the focus in many ways of saying what is Boaz, uh, what is Boaz going to do? And we have this incredible, uh, intense scene described in chapter 3 here where Naomi comes up with a plan. Naomi tells Ruth this is what she needs to do to inquire of Boaz and in the cultural moment here, I mean, this is a remarkable, a remarkable plan, remarkable scheme that Ruth, as a foreign woman, would approach Boaz and ask him to do what he is able to do. Uh, and in, in it, you could just say that she, she asks Boaz to be her redeemer, to be Naomi's redeemer, and really offers to him, say, hey, we, we should get married, <laughs> in a sense, is what we see in chapter 3. But this is an incredibly charge scene where Naomi sends Ruth. Ruath goes to Boaz at the threshing floor. He's been working during harvest. He's fallen asleep uh, there, and Naomi says, go, lay at his feet, and when he awakes, lay the case out before him. Essentially say, you have opportunity. Uh, you have <laughs> you have opportunity. You have motive. You have the means to be my redeemer, and so I'm asking that you would be my redeemer. Um, this this interaction between Ruth and Naomi, I think there's a lot of language, I'm sorry, Ruth and Boaz, there's a lot of language here that is used to heighten the sense of the seriousness of what is taking place here. You know, this is, this is the only option for Ruth and for Naomi to find uh, redemption, to find the provision that they need to live. And this is an incredibly startling scene. Now, I think we read this and we're familiar. If we're familiar with the story, we overlook things. But there's so much language that's used to, uh, to heighten what's going, on, what's going on here. Now, you can, you can read. Uh, there is a grand, uh, uh, I don't know. There's lots of different ways that people have interpreted what's going on in, in chapter 3. Uh, there, there are those who read this and say, okay, this, there is so much sexual language that's being used in this passage that it has to have described some sort of sexual encounter that took place between Ruth and Boaz, and the author is just kind of describing it in a nicer way to cover that up. I definitely don't think that's the case. I think actually the author is intentional to use language and to describe the scene in such a way that shows that Boaz goes out of his way to act in a way that is pure and respectful of Ruth, and they do that which is proper and consistent with uh, the worship of and follow of, of Yahweh. But I do want you to see, I think the author does use in chapter 3 a lot of evocative sexual language to heighten the, the, the seriousness of what's happening here. To say, oh, there is, there's a lot going on. Just notice, uh, Ruth goes and lays down at Boaz's, uh, lays down at Boaz's feet. Um, if you're familiar with other places in the Old Testament, sometimes feet are used for a euphemism for 
sexual body parts. And so if you're a reader of this and you know that, you're okay, okay, what's going on here? Again, I don't think that's what's being used here, but I do think the author has that in the back of his mind, and that does uh, highlight for us the seriousness of what's taking place. We're told that Ruth uncovers Boaz's feet, lays down at his feet, and then he awakes, and he's startled, and he says, oh, there's a woman laying at my feet at the middle of the night, what in the world is going on here? And then they enter into this, this sweet encounter uh, there. So let's look specifically uh, at verse 8, where it describes what happens. It says, At midnight the man was startled, and he turned over. I think this is hilarious. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. He's like, what? What is going on? He said, Who are you? It's dark. He can't see. And this is how she answers. She says, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. What a short and simple and beautiful way, drawing from the language that, that Boaz had used back in chapter 2, saying that she had come under the wings to find refuge under Yahweh. And Ruth says, Boaz, spread your wings over me. Redeem me. You have the opportunity to... Uh, to provide for me and to and to marry me, and so she she expresses that to him. We're told later that Boaz is interested in redeeming Ruth. He wants to care for her, but he knows that there is someone else close. There's a nearer relative who uh, has uh, first rights, you could say, to do that. And so the the end of chapter three ends with this suspense. Okay. Boaz, Ruth has made this pitch. Boaz is interested in redeeming Ruth, and yet there's one more hurdle in the way. There's one more hurdle in the way to their marriage and to this redemption that could uh, take place between them. So let's look and see in chapter 4 how it, how it comes to a conclusion. We're told in chapter 4 that Boaz goes to this other closer relative that could lay claim on Ruth, and on all of the lands and the wealth uh, that Elimelech owned that were to remain within the tribe. And uh, Boaz enters into this encounter, this exchange with the man, saying, hey, you, you could redeem. And notice how he goes about it. He brings up first the lands and the wealth that are part of Elimelech's family. And the man says, oh, yeah, I'll redeem that. I'll take his lands and I'll pay for that. And then what does Boaz say? Uh, verse 5. The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth. Hey, don't forget, uh, she's a Moabite. Uh, don't forget, she's the widow of the dead. And you also have to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. I love how, I love Boaz's, uh, he's pretty sly. He, know, he, he knows how to, he's, he, he ropes him in. You can have the lands, you can have the wealth, but you also have to have this foreign wife, uh, don't forget that her husband died, and uh, you, you also have to perpetuate his name. Since he's saying, in this redemption, in this lever at marriage, any children that you have with Ruth uh, actually will remain in the family line of Elimelech. That's what, that's what happens within this lever at marriage. But we know that Boaz, he says, this other man says he cannot. Boaz commits himself to redeem Ruth. They go through this exchange uh, using their sandals. You can recall back from uh, what we read in Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 25, a, a similar scene. There's no spit. There's no, spit. <laughs> There's no Boaz does not spit in his face or, or do the, what was the line? Uh, he whose sandal has been removed from him or whatever that was. But Boaz commits himself to redeem Ruth. Uh, look at verse 9 of chapter 4. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, all that belonged to Kilion and Malon, and also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife and to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. Boaz is saying, I will do it. I'll redeem her, and any children that we have from our marriage will be uh, as, as if they were the children of her former uh, dead husband. And we see there a beautiful scene there at the end of that section where the people there at the gate, they bless Boaz, and they make these incredible blessings. They may, may the woman, Ruth, May she be like Rachel and Leah. May she build up the house 
of Israel. And may your house be great like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this woman. So this, even then, their blessings give us a heightened sense of what God is doing in a grander way through uh, their, their marriage and, and their children. And then lastly, here in chapter 4, we're told that they're married. Boaz, Boaz and Ruth are married. Uh, and verse 13, and the Lord gave her conception. Where else do we see that kind of language uh, previously in the Pentateuch, in the storyline so far? We see it in lots of places throughout the Bible. But Sarah, okay. You think about all the, who else? Somebody said Rachel? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So already here, I think, we're beginning to see of what God is up to, associating Ruth in the long line of God's covenant faithfulness to, uh, to allow for children from the descendants of Abraham, right? And the storyline of the Bible picks up on that. He says, the Lord gives, gave her conception. We have no, Naomi's uh, excitement, uh, verse 14 or the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. So these women are reminding Naomi and reminding us, this is God's doing. God has brought about this redemption. And, uh, and we see there that Naomi is consoled by the birth of the son from Boaz and Ruth's marriage. All right, so we've gone, through, we've gone through the four chapters. We've seen the storyline. I do want us just to look briefly at a few different passages to highlight some, some major things. And we've already touched on some of these, so we won't spend as much time on, on all of them. But a few of the key texts that I think, if we're trying to think through terms of application, what's going on here in the book of Ruth, a few things that I think we need to see. Uh, I think the first one in your notes I have listed there is the bitterness of sin. This is inviting us, uh, showing us the importance of, especially looking at Naomi and seeing the effects of uh, a certain view of God, right? She, she describes, even in her own knowledge of God's sovereignty, we see this bitterness taking place in Naomi's heart in light of her suffering that she has experienced. And it changes how she lives, right? It changes her interactions with Ruth and, and Orpah. Uh, it changes the way that she views her situation. And honestly, even in Naomi's scheming, this plan that she makes up with Ruth in chapter 3, it's really hard to tell... Uh, the the moral quality of Naomi's uh, planning. You know, if you go back, and I encourage you to do, go back in chapter 3, Naomi is the one who schemes this plan for Ruth and Boaz to meet at the threshing floor. And it's it's hard to know. People differ on interpreting, is what is Naomi doing here? I mean, is she is she acting rightly in seeking to give them this interaction so that they can, uh, can result in Boaz redeeming? Or is she, is she acting wrong? Is she putting Ruth in an intentionally compromising and potentially dangerous situation for her own, her own good? Uh, I, I was reading this week, and I'd never heard this before. But one, you know, very respected evangelical scholar, he he ex, he suspects he reads into this and says that he thinks that Naomi is seeking to exploit a portion of the Mosaic law. Uh, by putting Ruth and Boaz in a in a compromising situation to force Boaz's hand, which I I, I don't know I, I'm not wholly convinced by that. But he goes back. He points to a place in the Mosaic law where God gives the prescription: if a man lies with a woman who is not married, uh, then what is the result? Well, he must he must marry her and he must care for her. Now again. I don't think there's a sexual interaction that takes place in chapter 3, but he portrays it as Naomi acting out of a, in an unfaithful, dishonest, shrewding manner. I'm not sure there. It's ambiguous in the text. Mm-hmm. We get some reactions like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have to judge his acts. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think, again, I think that ambiguity is is intentional, right? Because what does that do? In the midst of this ambiguity, we're not sure what Naomi's up to. It's hard to know Ruth is acting nobly. She's put in a really hard situation. And in the midst of all of that ambiguity, Boaz acts exceedingly righteously. Mm -hmm. And that's pointing to God's character, God's faithfulness, God redeeming his his people. Uh, And we see that in the in the experience of, of Boaz. Uh, but in the midst of Naomi's experience, uh, her, her bitterness, her difficulty over what's taking place, we're reminded that God is not a primarily, a, he's not a bringer of bitterness, but he's a bringer of mercy, right? You just think about what's going on in the book of Judges and also in Ruth. In the midst of the chaos of the people's sin, God is still acting proactively to bless his people and to be faithfulness to his promises. And so what should that prompt in us? In the midst of the difficulty of our situations, whatever the the suffering uh, and the effects of sin that we're experiencing in our life, either our own or those around us, Ruth helps us to cast our eyes to see God in a particular way, that he redeems us in the midst of our mess and that we can we can trust in him. And ultimately we see that in what Jesus has done. Uh, for us. So just briefly there, the bitterness of sin. I encourage you to dwell on that more in your own time. Think about that. Uh, Another aspect, specifically in Ruth chapter 4, we we already walked through the redemption that Boaz enacts for Ruth and Naomi. But I encourage you to dwell on this later, this notion of the kindness of of Boaz's action, the kindness of his his redemption, Um, and this description of what Boaz does, right? He he, what does he do? He, by his own initiative and by his own seeking to be uh, faithful and obedient to God's law, which we see Boaz is really portrayed as one who is living according to God's commands, especially from the book of, of Deuteronomy, that he goes out of his way to redeem and to care for Ruth and to care for Naomi and to be their redeemer. This is a demonstration of what we see elsewhere in the rest of the Bible as a description of God's salvation for his people. Uh, Everywhere in the scripture where you see redemption described as a what's taking place in God saving his people, uh, the primary instance or pointer of that is the Exodus, right? That's the place of redemption. But also elsewhere in scripture, we're giving further uh, further data, you could say, to describe what God does through Christ in our uh, redemption. Just one passage that I want to give you uh, that you can go spend some time at time in is Galatians chapter 3. This is one of the examples of New Testament passages that describe our salvation in Christ as that of, that of redemption. So Galatians chapter 3, verse uh, 13. This is what Paul says that Jesus did for us. He says that Christ redeemed us. So there's that language of redemption. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, our situation apart from him, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree. Describing what Jesus has done in our salvation, entering into our situation and our mess to, to purchase us, to bring us out, to bring us into to life and to, and to salvation. I encourage you to dwell on that more on your own time, this thought, this notion of redemption and what Jesus has done for us. And then lastly, I just want us to remember and to highlight this theme that's everywhere in the book of Ruth and in this place in the storyline, the wisdom of God's good plan. We see in the last few verses of Ruth chapter 4 that the author makes the jump for us to say, okay, this is really about leading up to David. He gives the genealogy of David there at the end of chapter 4. And then also... Uh, as we have done previously, I think we just have to go to Matthew Matthew chapter 1. We did this with Rahab in the book of Joshua. And then also here, where in the genealogy of Jesus that Matthew gives to us in Matthew chapter 1, uh, we are told explicitly in chapter, or in verse 5 and verse 6, giving the genealogy of Jesus, it says, Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, 
and Jesse, the father of David, the king, leading up to and describing for us the genealogy and the birth of Jesus, who we're told in verse 1, who is Jesus, the Christ, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. So as followers of Jesus now, in an even greater way than the people of Israel could in the Old Testament, we're able to look at the story of Ruth and say, what was, what was God up to? Well, not only was he up to bringing about the birth of King David and everything that that entails, God's covenant promises to David, but in the book of Ruth, we see God's covenant faithfulness, God's commitment to redemption, to salvation for his people, in that Ruth is in the family line, the, the great, 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 however many greats, grandmother of Jesus, according to, according to the flesh. So we have to read Ruth and see this is God's activity at this point in time that leads us to the birth of Jesus and the salvation and the redemption that he brings. And that God is sovereignly at work here in Ruth. And again, don't let it be lost on us that in the chaos of Judges, we're given a story of a specific family and God's work in their midst. I think that's a really helpful reminder for us that um, God's work of redemption is not done in abstract, right? It's done in individuals. It's done in specific families, and that is what that is what God has done uh, through through Jesus and His life and His death and His resurrection. Okay. Any last any concluding thoughts? Um, it's felt disjointed. I mean, we've tried to cover a lot of ground covering all of the book of Ruth. But any thoughts or highlights or any things that uh, we need to go back and talk to before we're done with Ruth? That's a good question. So was Ruth familiar with this notion of redemption, marriage from a relative, from her, from her own upbringing, from Moab? Uh, well, we're not told. I mean, we're not told if there's a, there could have been some sort of a similar custom and practice elsewhere. Um, so we're not told that specifically. I think reading it as, reading it as students... You know, as as followers of Jesus, as students of the Bible, what what we're meant to bring to that is to say God had provided a mechanism for provision for the most vulnerable. Like He'd done that very intentionally in the law to provide for the widows, the fatherless, for the orphans. Uh, and so, I don't know. I mean, Ruth comes to experience that and reap the benefits of that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I don't know what her knowledge of that would have been before. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. And that's that's the highlight for us. We say, well, what's this book about? It's about God's work to bring about salvation, ultimately. And it's comforting for us, I think. My my habit, the way you know, I was at least as we tell these stories, especially as as kids, our immediate uh, our me, our immediate reaction is to say, okay, these are the characters in this story, and so they should be held up as models for us, all of them. So it's like, okay, how should I be like Ruth? How should I be like Naomi? How should I be like Boaz? And some of that's very valid, but yet I think the grander uh, message for us in this is that in the midst of their ambiguity. Sometimes they acted rightly. Sometimes they acted wrongly. This whole situation in many ways, in some ways, is a mess. Uh, 
that God is acting sovereignly to accomplish his purposes and that he's not hindered by their mess. And man, that's that's incredibly encouraging for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's a mess. Yeah. And in the mess of the the microcosm of the mess in Judges, this is a breath of fresh air. A breath of fresh air. A breath of fresh air of what God's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Keith, any last thoughts? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, God's not just sitting back and waiting to see what's happening in this. He's actively working. Yeah, that's good. Okay, it's past time. Thank you all. Uh, Thanks for bearing with me. It was good being with you in that. We're going to go through uh, a shorter passage next week. So all of 1 and 2 Samuel. And uh, then we'll... (laughs) Yeah, and we'll continue on. Thank you all.